I want to express my, uh, my gratitude uh, to the hosts of this conference uh, for this opportunity. Uh, so I should explain that I'm a historian, uh, and I, um, I come to this subject of the Quran through the lens of history. Uh, history is a toolbox uh, intellectually uh, and, and um, methodologically uh, that focuses in especially on context, change over time, uh, and so forth. And um, uh, it's a way of thinking that actually I think has to be learned and non-historians are usually quite appalled and upset when they figure out how we think. Um, because uh, uh, when you ask the meaning of a text like the Quran or a verse of the Quran, uh, that's a very complicated subject because what did it mean to Muhammad? What did it mean to the people around Muhammad? What did it mean to the people around the people uh, uh, around Muhammad? What did it mean to the children, to the grandchildren, to the great-grandchildren? All of those meanings are different from a historian's point of view. And there's a, there's a, the shock of the past uh, is that when you go back and, and understand how people thought uh, even 50 years ago, it's often a shock. Uh, so um, I agree with those other historians of the Quran who, who say that there's an epistemological rupture between the time of the Quran uh, and um, the later late Umayyad and then Abbasid commentary, uh, historical, biographical literature. I think our field, and, and indeed humankind generally for the last 1400 years, has tended to be told how to read the Quran by the late Umayyad and Abbasid uh, authors, uh, and uh, that um, uh, this is a mistake, uh, that, uh, that they, had an understanding which was contextual to them, uh, but it wasn't, uh, uh, it wasn't necessarily connected to the seventh century. Uh, and so the argument that I'm making here um, is not original with me, but it's an unusual argument uh, in the history of the last 1400 years. Uh, it's associated most recently with Glenn Bowersock, um, who, was a great, is a great classicist, uh, made his career largely at Harvard, now lives in Princeton, and has written a trilogy, uh, Empires in Collision in Late Antiquity, Throne of Adulus, Crucible of Islam, uh, which uh, uh, comes on a lifetime of work on uh, the Roman Empire and Late Antiquity and, uh, and, and an interest in uh, the Near Eastern uh, parts of the Roman Empire. Uh, and, and which works its way around, I think, to arguing that Muhammad and his followers tilted towards Rome uh, in the great war of 603 to 629 between the Eastern Roman Empire and the Sasanian Empire. Um, and, um, and indeed that Religious communities were one of the kind of political building blocks of these various imperial coalitions so that uh, Jews, um, Miaphysites, uh, Zoroastrians tilted towards the Sasanians during the war, Chalcedonian Christians tilted towards uh, uh, the, the Eastern Roman Empire, on the whole and by and large. Of course, there would have been exceptions uh, and, um, and then that, that Muhammad and his followers were more on the Chalcedonian side. Uh, and I, I can't tell you how rare this point of view has been in the literature. Uh, and so Bowersock is, is, uh, is making an argument that's, that's original. Um, he doesn't go as far with the argument as I do, uh, in part because he's not an Arabist, and I think he's still uh, beholden to the Abbasids in some ways, and so he, he makes, uh, he makes a, a beginning in this direction, but I'm uh, going to go further than he did. And the first thing I wanna 
underline is that um, the, we're beginning to know a lot more about Arabic-speaking peoples uh, of the Eastern Roman Empire. After all, uh, Rome conquered this area of the Levant uh, in 106. And so by the time of the prophet Muhammad, they had been living un under Rome for hundreds of years. Uh, and many of them had strong political uh, ties uh, to the, uh, and cultural ties to the Roman Empire. It's increasingly clear that the Eastern Roman Empire maintained Greek as the urban standard. The Petra Papyri, which were only discovered in the, the 1990s, make it clear the, 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 that notable Arabic-speaking families in, in Transjordan were functioning in Greek for formal purposes. I think this was very common in Damascus and, and elsewhere. Uh, so that people would have been often trilingual uh, in Greek and Aramaic and, and, and Arabic. Uh, and, um, uh, and the Safaitic uh, uh, inscriptions, uh, which, uh, uh, of which there are thousands uh, and which are increasingly being studied, sometimes make clear this connection to the Romans, which goes back hundreds of years. So here I give you a, a few inscriptions just as an example. Uh, by Nu'aman, son of Khabith, son of Nasser, uh, of, the, of the Duff. And he set up a standing stone, a, a, a Nasab, a, 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 a shrine to a god, um, in, uh, for tea in the year that Caesar sent reinforcements to the province and put the province in good order. So here is a pre-Islamic Arabic-speaking person worshiping the old gods, Allah, and, 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 and so forth, who... Um, is appreciative of, of Caesar uh, and, and the Pax Romana, the order that the Roman Empire was giving it. Uh, by Zan, son of Chasman, son of Zan, of the lineage of Duff, that same tribe, who was a commander the year Caesar ejected the Persians, and so a lot may he enjoy peace and security. So Caesar is being wished the peace and security of the go great goddess, uh, the Arab goddess, a lot, uh, by this person, who seems to have been actually maybe a federati, one of the uh, Arab uh, commanders, uh, Arabic-speaking commanders who, uh, who uh, helped, uh, who were auxiliaries to the, to the Roman uh, legion. Um, there's another uh, Safedic ins inscription. The year uh, word was sent to Caesar that the people of the Roman Empire died and Damascus burned. Uh, these are all published uh, at the Oceana, uh, the online corpus of the inscriptions of ancient North Arabia website. Uh, and um, uh, this one was probably initially mistranslated. Ahmed al-Jalad, uh, who uh, almost always gets it right, uh, has retranslated it. Uh, but this is obviously uh, a time when probably the Sasanians in the uh, third century had come in. Uh, had attacked Damascus and uh, set fires and uh, uh, people were being killed uh, in, uh, it says in Rome, but it means in the Roman Empire, it means in, in the Levant, Levantine part of the Roman Empire. So of course these are, Sephardic inscriptions are somewhere between the, uh, the first century BC and, the, and, the, uh, uh, and 400 uh, uh, AD or so. Uh, they're substantially before the rise of Islam. But the few mentions of Caesar that we have in them show these ties of, of loyalty, of appreciation for the Pax Romana, of, uh, and, and so forth, that were part of Arabophone culture for hundreds of years. None of this is, is in the Abbasid literature. Uh, the Abbasid literature, on the whole and by and large, um, uh, dissociates. Uh, Southern Transjordan and the Hejaz from the Roman Empire. And I, I think what's being shown uh, by, by increasingly by the archeological and, and, and historical work that's being done is that Transjordan and the, and the Northern Hejaz were a part of the Roman Empire uh, and, and often uh, part of Hejaz was. Um, and, the, and, and, and this process of integration intensified over time so that in the 500s, uh, the Emperor Justinian uh, uh, actually appointed uh, Arabic-speaking uh, 
uh, tribal leaders from the Bano Jaffna uh, uh, as phylarchs. They gave them an official title and trained their troops, uh, trained their tribesmen in Roman cavalry tactics and made them uh, adjuncts and auxiliaries to uh, legions like the one in, in Bostra. Uh, and um, at one point, Procopius uh, says that uh, one of the Banu Jaffna phylarchs, Abu Qarab, who was responsible for Transjordan and the Sinai, uh, actually gave the Hejaz to, to, to Stinian because he apparently had a great deal of political clout there and it was a kind of feudal gift to the, to the emperor in Constantinople. Uh, again, uh, Procopius himself is from Caesarea, is an urban Palestinian. He makes fun that you know the Hejaz was kind of worthless anyway. Uh, but uh, uh, this kind of relationship of the Hejaz to Constantinople is nowhere in the later sources. Uh, and so, I think if we look at uh, the, the the Eastern Roman uh, literature and the Sephardic inscriptions, something like uh, the Quran verse Rome thirty. Uh, uh, one through six, uh, takes on a, a very different uh, aspect. And so it says, Rome lies vanquished in the nearest province, but in the wake of their defeat, they will triumph after a few years. Before and after, it is God who is in command. On that day, the believers will rejoice in the victory of God. He causes to triumph whomever he will, and he is mighty, the merciful. It is the promise of God. God does not break his promises, but most people do not know it. Now, if we just set aside what we think we know about Islam and the Quran, um, and we read this from a seventh century common sense point of view, what's being said here? Heraclius, the then emperor, uh, has suffered a major defeat somewhere near the Hejaz. Some commentators say that this is a reference to the fall of Damascus or the fall of Dara uh, uh, to the north. Uh, to the Sasanian invaders uh, in 613. Uh, but uh, what's being said here is that Heraclius will come back from this defeat and he will ultimately prove victorious and that that will be the victory of God and the believers will rejoice at it. Sounds to me like Team Rome. The, the early Muslims around Muhammad were rooting for a side. Uh, and, um, uh, and moreover, this passage in the Quran is not unique. Uh, I found uh, two other instances of some, or actually three other instances, three other texts that could be uh, looked at uh, as having similar sentiments. One is in the chronicle of uh, Theophilactos uh, Simokatis, uh, uh, who was a contemporary of the Prophet Muhammad and, was, uh, and, and wrote in the 620s, uh, who predicted 21 years of Sasanian rule and then seven years of Roman restoration, after which he expected the end time would arrive. So it, it, if we looked at it in this light, in the light of, of Christian Roman thinking about the future after the Sasanian victory, uh, there could even be a kind of millenarian aspect to this verse of, of Rome, which is not how it's ever really been read. Uh, and, and then uh, in, the, uh, uh, um, uh, in, in, in Jacob the newly baptized, which was a, a, a Christian a, a, a apologetic work attempting to convert Jews, uh, which probably is actually late uh, 7th century, uh, although it's been dated as early as 640, uh, it has a passage in which one of the characters, uh, it's a kind of novel, uh, says that uh, the, the, the empire is diminished right now, but it, it will regain its former stature. Uh, and then there was a coin issued in 616 by, by Heraclius, who it was in a silver coin because he had run out of gold, uh, and uh, uh, in, in which it, it asked for God to give victory to the Romans, and it's a kind of combination prayer and war cry, and very similar to this uh, 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 30, uh, uh, verse 36 in the Quran. Um, and then 
one of the earliest pieces of exegesis that we have is from, uh, was probably best thought of as a late Umayyad author, although he's writing early in the Abbasid period, Muqattal bin Suleiman al-Balqi, uh, who, who wrote that Rome and the Iranians fought and Rome was vanquished and this news reached the prophet and his companions in Mecca and was grievous for them. The pagans rejoiced and gloated and confronted the companions of the prophet saying, you are the people of the book and the Romans are the people of the book, but our brethren, the people of Iran, have triumphed over your siblings from the Roman Empire. So you, you have this witness uh, earlier on in Islamic history to this pro-Roman attitude among the, uh, the community of the prophet uh, and, and this reaction uh, to, uh, to the fall of, of, uh, of the Levant to the Sasanians. Um, gradually, this passage of Suleiman, uh, Muqattal bin Suleiman stops being cited very much. And, and, and later, Abbasid authors really don't talk very much about the prophet and his community being pro-Roman. I think it's not hard to understand because by the early Abbasid period, by the late 700s, they had been at war. Uh, Baghdad was at war with, with the Byzantines. Uh, and uh, so it's kind of inconvenient that your prophet had been rooting for that side. Uh, and so I think they gradually drop this part of the story out. Um, and what's one struck by the Quran is that there's this pro-Christian attitude politically in it throughout, not just in one part of it, but all through from the Meccan to the, to the Medinan surahs. Um, so Surah Al-Ma'adah, which, uh, you know, so, some think is, is probably the last surah in the Quran from the period 630 to 632, uh, it says you will find that those most intensely hostile to the believers are Jews and pagans, and you will find that the nearest to them in love are those who say we are Christians. That is because they have among them priests and monks, and they are not haughty. And when they hear what has been revealed to the messenger, you see their eyes overflowing with tears, inasmuch as they recognize the truth and say, Our Lord, we have believed, so inscribe us among those who bear witness. Um, in, in 630, the Roman Empire has recovered the Near East. And if you told me, and you didn't say it was the Quran, you said you just had a text that said this, and it was dated 630, I would say, well, that's, that's a pro-Roman source. That's, that's a source that's happy that the empire is back, it's happy about its good relations with the restored uh, dominant uh, uh, Christianity. And, and Bowersock, you know, I, I think is very good on this, that, that, uh, that a lot of the Jewish community uh, um, sided with the Sasanians. They had done so in Yemen from, from the 570s, uh, and they're alleged, or at least some of them are alleged to have done so. Uh, uh, there are a lot of politics around the history of this uh, when the Sasanians came in in the, in the 610s in the Near East. Uh, and, Heraclius was furious at them, at the Jews. And uh, initially he met with them when he came uh, back uh, to uh, Jerusalem um, uh, after the war was over uh, and um, uh, gave them promises that they wouldn't be harmed. But then in 632, the same year the prophet died, uh, Heraclius banned Judaism. Completely. They were all going to have to convert to Christianity. Uh, and um, the only thing that, that saved the Jews of uh, Tiberias and the Galilee, because there was quite a substantial Jewish population still in geographic Palestine, was that the Romans lost the Levant to, to the invading uh, uh, followers of Muhammad. Uh, but had Heraclius been able to make his authority stick, uh, Judaism would have been wiped out there. So in the, this context, this political context, a verse like this, if you say it's from 630, uh, it's, um, it's telling us uh, about political uh, alignments. All right. Um, then there's this, this verse uh, uh, which is 
from a period obviously before uh, Makkah has acquiesced uh, to the prophet in January of, of uh, 630, uh, in which it says that those who fought because they were wronged, which is to say the followers of Muhammad who took up arms uh, against the, the pagans in, in Mecca, uh, it says of them, had God not checked one people with another, then monasteries, churches, oratories, and places of worship wherein God was much mentioned would have been raised to the ground. God aids those who aid him. God is powerful and mighty. Well, this is the language of, of a, an ally of the Christian Roman Empire. And what's being said, as I understand the verse, is that those little battles that happened in the Hejaz, in Ohud and, and uh, Badr and, 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 and Khandak and so forth, and, and, and Hunayn, that part of the implication of them was that if the, the pagans had managed to take over the Hejaz in alliance probably with the, the Sasanians, that there would have been attacks. And we know now that there were like monasteries in northern Hejaz, there were Christians in Najran, maybe even uh, uh, Christians in southern uh, Transjordan would have been liable for, for predatory raids uh, from these victorious pro-Sasanian uh, pagans. So uh, again, uh, th this, this language is the language of an ally uh, and uh, the, the Arab, uh, 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 the Ben Jaff, uh, Jaffna and so forth, the phylarchs of the of the of the Constantinople, uh, often alerted monasteries when there might be a raid from the Sasanian territory by by uh, Arab tribes. Uh, so um, I'm coming to the end of my time here, and uh, I've just been managed just to discuss a few verses of the Quran. There are lots more, uh, and and they are consistent. Uh, and it seems to me incontrovertible uh, that the Quran, uh, in ways that still, I mean, how this works theologically is hard to know. But remember that Garth Foden, uh, a historian of late antiquity, argued that, uh, you know, politics is politics. Uh, uh, how was Khosrow II, the Sasanian, defeated by Heraclius? So he made an alliance with pagans in Central Asia. Uh, the, 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 the Gothic uh, Aryan uh, uh, powers were often on the Byzantine side. Uh, Axum, which was Miaphysite, lined up with, uh, with, with Constantinople against Iran. Uh, so the, the religious difference didn't seem to prevent a group from joining what Foden called the Byzantine Commonwealth, what I would call the Eastern Roman Commonwealth. And that's my argument, is the Quran grew up in a milieu where the early believers were aspiring to be and, 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 and uh, spiritually and intellectually were uh, part of the Eastern Roman ecumene in the face of Sasanian expansionism. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'd like to start by thanking uh, Iksa for hosting this conference, uh, and I'm delighted to be here. Uh, and I'm here to talk to you about Napoleon, but I'm also here to represent a, a new European research project called the European Quran, which is financed by the European Research Council. It's just started, uh, we're just starting up, and it's financed for six years, so it'll be running until 2025. And the idea of the European Quran is to look at the impact of Quran in European culture by studying how non-Muslim Europeans have studied the Quran, uh, copied it, uh, bought manuscripts of it, translated it, commented on it, and also at how uh, the Quran has, in many ways, unexpected uh, impact on European culture. So you've got flyers, I've brought propaganda that's out there. You can find these flyers in English, French, and in Arabic. It's a project uh, that I'm running with my colleagues Mercedes Garcia Renal, uh, Roberto Totori, and Jan Lope. Uh, we've got various partners. We're happy uh, to be working uh, with people here. Uh, Gabriel Said Reynolds is part of our uh, 
advisory board, uh, Emmanuel Stefanidis, who is here, will be soon joining our team as one of our postdocs. And we've, uh, we're very happy, we're excited, we've been able to uh, recruit uh, an impressive uh, and very dynamic group of postdocs and doctoral students who will be starting with us in the next several months. But as one example of the unexpected kinds of impact that reading the Quran can have in European culture, I want to look at Napoleon as a reader of the Quran. And this is related to our UQ European Quran project. It's also related to uh, research I've been doing on images of the prophet uh, in European culture. I published a book uh, in France uh, last year, Mahomet l'Européen, uh, which has just been published now in English uh, at Princeton uh, called Faces of Mohammed on uh, the history of Western representations of the prophet uh, from uh, the Middle Ages uh, until today. Uh, but uh, let's get to Napoleon. Uh, reading the Quran in the context of empire is a theme that brings us together here. Uh, the empire, of course, can be Muslim. From the early caliphate uh, to the Ottoman Empire, and beyond, Muslims elites have read the Quran in ways to justify their power over other Muslims and over non-Muslims. Uh, Tangier, in the 10th century, was a battleground between two rival caliphates, the Umayyads of Cordoba and the Fatimids of Ifriqiya. It would subsequently see the Almoravids, Almohads, Marinids, and others justify their power uh, and their fight against Muslim and non-Muslim adversaries, in part through their supposedly superior reading and understanding of the Quran. We'll have the opportunity to come back uh, to this uh, theme uh, numerous occasions over the next couple of days. But European rulers could also use the Quran uh, to justify their imperial projects in Muslim lands. This is true, for example, in 13th century Spain, where Archbishop Rodrigo Jiménez de Rada commissioned Marcos de Toledo to produce a Latin translation of the Quran in the 13th century as part of an intellectual arsenal justifying the Christian conquest of Muslim Spain. For Rodrigo and Marcos, the Quran, alternatively known as the Law of Muhammad or the Law of the Saracens, was an illegitimate pseudo-revelation of a false prophet Exposing it to refutation and derision was part of the ideological arsenal of reconquest Spain. Now, Napoleon Bonaparte employed the Quran in a very different way. He read it respectfully, reverently, or so he frequently affirmed. And he argued that the Quran could be used to legitimate French rule in Egypt. Napoleon's conquest of Egypt short-lived though it was, has been seen as the initiatory act of European imperialism in the Middle East. Napoleon's Egyptian expedition has recently been the object of two important monographs, one by Juan Cole and uh, the other by Jacques Olivier Boudon. Uh, Edward Said made the, Napoleon's conquest uh, of Egypt into the sort of initiatory act of modern Orientalism. Uh, he saw Napoleon going not only with an army of conquest, but also an army of scholars who were there to appropriate uh, the knowledge of the East and to make sense of it and to bring back this knowledge and to bring back, obviously, artifacts from Egypt. Uh, for Saïd, the, the description de l'Egypte exemplified the link between knowledge and power key to his concept of Orientalism. But he paid less attention to the intellectual baggage that Napoleon brought with him, in particular Napoleon's ideas about Islam and the Quran. A number of Enlightenment writers, from Henry Stubb in 17th century England to Irish deist John Toland, no relation, in the early 18th century, to Henri de, Henri de Boulanvier, Voltaire, or Emmanuel Pastore, depicted Mohammed as an anti-clerical hero, and the Quran as a basis for the most rational of monotheisms. And this very positive and very naive view of Islam, uh, it's this view that Napoleon brings with him to Egypt, and which bears part of the responsibility both for his successes and for his ultimate failure. In particular, Napoleon had read Claudia Etienne Savary's 
1783 translation of the Quran into French, which he took with him to Egypt. Savary had sojourned in Egypt from 1776 to 1779. His Lettres sur l'Egypte, published in 1785 to 86, were widely read and, along with the works of Volney and others, prepared the grounds uh, for Napoleon's expedition. Savary lambasted earlier translators. He called Dirier's 17th century French translation flat and boring. Maracci, uh, who published a massive edition and Latin translation with commentary in Rome in 1698, was uh, for Savary, an accomplished scholar and linguist whose partner, partisan, partisanship got the better of him. Quote, it's not the thoughts of the Quran that he expressed, but the words which he travestied in a barbarous Latin. Savary chose to, wrote, to write his translation in Egypt in the midst of the Arabs, uh, alive to their ways of life and to the music of their language. Like other 18th century European writers, he had attuned the poetic power of the Quran, the admiration it inspires among Arabs, thanks to, quote, the magic of its style, the care which Muhammad embellishes his prose with the ornaments of poetry. It's Muhammad's prose because for Savary, as for many European writers, Muhammad is the author of the Quran. Uh, but this for him takes nothing away from its message, that of a purified monotheism or philosophical deism. I quote, the Quran's dogma is a belief in one God whose prophet is Muhammad. Its fundamental principles are prayer, alms, fasting during the month of Ramadan, and the pilgrimage to Mecca. The morals it preaches are founded on natural law and on what is most appropriate to peoples in a hot climate. Savary prefaces his translation with a 248-page biography of the prophet in which he relies on Arab sources in translation. For Savary, Muhammad began at the age of 25, shortly after his marriage with Khadija, to retire for one month a year to the solitary cave of Hira, where he had contemplated the state of the world and began to construct the edifice of Islamisme. Th through their wars of religion, the Greeks had driven the Jews and Christians out of their empire, and Juan Cole has just presented this context to us. Uh, they had, according to Savary, these Jews and Christians had taken refuge in Arabia, true Christians and Jews, uh, where Muhammad met them and learned their doctrines. He contemplated the corruption of the two mighty empires with clay feet. He saw how Jews and Christians bickered among themselves. He crafted a new doctrine he hoped could rally Jews and Christians and galvanize the Arabs. Quote, it took 15 years to cast the foundations of his religious system. He had to bring it to light and above all had to hide the hand that attached, the heaven, attached to heaven the chain of mortals. He pretended that he did not know how to read and write and relying on his natural eloquence, on a fertile genius that never failed him, he took the imposing title of prophet. Numa took lessons from the nymph Egeria. Mohammed shows as his teacher the archangel Gabriel. Now, Savary never uses the word imposter to describe Muhammad, a word that many European uh, authors use to describe him. Though clearly Savary thinks that he feigned his revelations. A great man and legislator like Numa or Muhammad must invent a divine source for his law, create a myth of origin for a new community. Far be it from Savary to criticize him for it. The comparison with the pro of the prophet with Numa Pompilius, legendary second king of Rome and legislator, was first made by humanists in Renaissance Italy. It's taken up in the 18th century by George Sale, Voltaire, and Pastore. And this kind of uh, strategy, you know, so often uh, until the 18th century and beyond, Christian writers were always comparing Muhammad with Jesus uh, or maybe Moses and obviously uh, using that comparison to dismiss him as a false prophet. Enlightenment writers uh, tended to take a step back and compare Muhammad to heroes of antiquity or heroes from other culture, uh, figures like Confucius or Zoroaster, uh, to present his, what he was doing in a much more positive light. Now, Savary's admiration for the great man, his lionizing of the warrior and hero, is clear on each of the 248 pages of the biography. 
up to including his description of the prophet's death, where like Voltaire, whom he follows, he portrays a man heroic and resigned in the faith of death, surrounded by family and followers. He concludes his portrait in unequivocal praise. I quote, Muhammad was one of those extraordinary men who, born with superior gifts, show up infrequently on the face of the earth to change it and to lead mortals behind their chariot. When we consider his point of departure and the summit of grandeur that he reached, we are astonished by what human genius can, can accomplish under favorable circumstances. Now this is Savary's Mohammed. It's also Bonaparte's Mohammed, uh, as Napoleon brought with him Savary's Quran on the ship that took him to Egypt. Savary gives detailed descriptions of Mohammed's military exploits and the reasons for their success. We can imagine that the general on his way to Egypt uh, read them with particular attention. After describing the Muslim victory of the Battle of Badr, uh, Savary says, by cultivating the hearts of his soldiers, the notion of a God who protects his arms, he made them invincible. At another point, he describes the lead up to the Battle of the Trench, when the Muslims are digging a trench, uh, they're afraid of the Meccans who are about to arrive, uh, and at one point they get discouraged, they're trying to break rock, uh, and uh, this is how Savary describes the uh, situation. The ground was rock and difficult to dig. The hard rock resisted the attacks of the workers and disheartened them. Muhammad, seeing their discouragement, took some water in his mouth and spit it on the rock. The rocks seemed to soften and soon gave way under the blows of the hammers. The Muslims proclaimed that it was a miracle, attributing to the virtues of this miraculous water the fruits of their renewed efforts. Just like Hannibal, who while making his way across the Alps encouraged his soldiers by sprinkling vinegar on the rock he sought to break. Everywhere the great man is the same. Everywhere he flattens the obstacles in his path and makes nature cede to his efforts. The invincible charm he uses to produce prodigies guarantees uh, the success and captivates the hearts of mortals. So again, we have the comparison with antiquity, Muhammad and uh, Hannibal, uh, and again, what this miracle from uh, Muslim tradition, uh, from the Sira tradition, is seen not as a real miracle, but as something that uh, Muhammad used the belief of his followers in miracles to be able to motivate them. Uh, so Muhammad is a new Hannibal, but of course with a difference. Hannibal managed to get his elephants across the Alps only to be defeated uh, by the Romans, whereas Muhammad went on to victory after victory. And it's clear that between the two, Napoleon identified with Muhammad. Uh, from the books of Voltaire, Savary, and others, Napoleon had understood that Islam was pure, uh, simple monotheism. This vision, deployed by 18th century European authors who were concerned uh, principally with criticizing the provenance of uh, Catholic or Anglican church showed little knowledge of Islam as was practiced by millions of Muslims. Edward Gibbon had affirmed that the prophet was reformer uh, and visionary and Islam was essentially the equivalent of philosophical deism. Napoleon seemed to have believed this and this belief shaped his policy in Egypt. Indeed, may have been one of the factors for, in his decision to invade Egypt. The French, having écrasé l'infâme, having dealt a blow to papal superstition, were deists who expected to find kindred spirit uh, in e Egypt's Muslims. And the French were the Muslim deists. Napoleon was their Corsican prophet. One of the ladies of his court, Madame de Remusat, says that years later the emperor had told her that on his way to Egypt, quote, I was creating a religion. I saw myself leaving on an elephant on the way to Asia with a turban on my head, in my hand, a new Al-Quran that I had composed to my liking. Now this is, of course, the badinage. This is Napoleon joking with one of the women of his court years afterwards, making light of his own ambitions. But clearly, uh, the identification between Napoleon and Mohammed is there, and we see this in his own writings. Now let me look now at how he himself describes uh, his time in Egypt in his memoirs, which were written towards the end of his life when he was exiled to the windswept island of St. Helena in the South Atlantic. 
From his first day in Egypt, he evokes the Quran and the prophet to attempt to convince the Egyptians that he comes as a friend, not a foe. On 2 July 1798, the French troops captured Alexandria. Napoleon issued a proclamation that was posted throughout the city in French, Arabic, and Turkish, announcing that the French had come to liberate the Egyptian from the tyranny of the Mamluks. People will tell you that I have come to destroy the religion of an Islam. Tell them that I love the Prophet and the Quran and that I come to restore your rights. The French army marched towards Cairo and on 21 July decisively defeated the army of uh, Mamluk ruler Murad Bey at the famous Battle of the Pyramids, leaving, leading to the capitulation of Cairo. Napoleon met with Cairo's ulama in the interior of the Great Pyramid of Giza. As he describes the meeting himself in his correspondence, he, he starts by proclaiming, glory to Allah, there is no other God than God. Muhammad is his prophet and I am his friend. <laughs> A mufti named Suleiman replies, God be upon, uh, excuse me, peace be upon God's emissary and peace to you also, invincible general Muhammad's favorite. Napoleon then responds, Mufti, thank you. The divine Quran delights my mind and draws the attention of my eyes. I love the prophet and I intend before long to go and see and honor his tomb in the sacred city, but my mission is to exterminate the Mamluks. So this is how Napoleon describes his mission. Uh, he, in his memoirs, describes at some length his strategy of seeking legitimacy through alliance with Cairo's religious elite. He repeated repeatedly insists on the respect, indeed love for Muhammad and the Quran. He gives Cairo's ulama a key role in ruling Egypt. This is both a pragmatic decision in the context of a power vacuum created by the defeat of the Mamluks and a ploy for legitimacy. If the religious elite recognized the legitimacy of Asultan al-Kabir, as he came to uh, call himself, the people he hopes will follow. Why did the Crusades fall after brilliant victories that brought about by tremendous efforts, asked Napoleon? Because of the religious hostility of the Muslims who rallied to drive the Crusaders out of the region. He cites Volney, who had written that in order to subdue Egypt, the French would have to fight three simultaneous wars against the English, against the Ottomans, and against the Muslims. And this last one was the one that was impossible to win. Uh, in order to avoid the defeat of the Crusaders, and the certain defeat predicted by Volney, Napoleon sought to win over the ulama, to convince them to interpret the Quran in a way that was favorable to French rule. He spared nothing to flatter, he says, these respectable old men, the muftis of the uh, four madhabs present in Cairo. He engaged in long discussions with them, asking them to explain the passage of the Quran to him, showing his great admiration for the prophet. These religious leaders were pleasantly surprised to find themselves invested with authority far greater uh, than any they had exercised before, judging both in religious and civil man, uh, matters. And Juan Cole has written about this. The French Jacobins who had taken over Notre Dame for the celebration of a, cult, of a cult of reason, who had invaded and subdued the Vatican, were now creating in Egypt the world's first modern Islamic republic. Napoleon claims that these ulama considered uh, that he, Napoleon, was protected by the prophet himself. The great revolution that he was effecting in Egypt had been predicted by numerous passages in the Quran, he affirmed. And the ulama did nothing to discourage the rumors that circulated among the Egyptian people, that Napoleon had memorized the Quran, that Muhammad had appeared to the general in visions. So Napoleon sought to uh, persuade uh, persuade Cairo's uh, religious leaders that Hina's troops uh, were Muslims. He asked them to pronounce the traditional Friday prayer, the khutbah, in his honor. Uh, they said they would be delighted to do so as soon as he and his troops converted to Islam. Thanks. Uh, and uh, they, uh, he said, well, you know, there's only one problem. My soldiers don't want to get circumcised and they like to drink wine. Uh, so there was a consultation and finally the muftis ruled that circumcision was not required uh, and that if the French wanted to continue drinking wine, they could do so. They would just have to make alms to uh, get forgiven for this sin against Muslim, uh, uh, against Muslim uh, 
law. So uh, the general seems to have thought that French Republican deists could be recognized as uh, Muslims without any real knowledge uh, of Islam. Uh, and in August 1798 was a traditional festival, the Maulid uh, Anabi, the birthday of the prophet, and Napoleon presided uh, these uh, ceremonies with uh, French marching bands and uh, m dancing uh, Sufi dervishes. Uh, Napoleon was uh, ha hailed as Ali Bonaparte. Uh, in on October 1st, 1798, Napoleon convened a Grand Divan, a council bringing together what he describes as all the notables and representatives of the provinces. Uh, this assembly, he says, was animated by the most positive sentiments towards a new order of things. The feudal principle, which had been imported by Mongols, Tartars, and Turks, uh, was foreign to the Arab Muslim uh, culture. Uh, the Divan proclaimed that the Governments of the Mamluks and Ottomans were contrary to the law of the Quran, but, quote, the laws of the West were in conformity with the spirit of the Book of Truth. Yet on 21 October, a major revolt erupted in the streets of Cairo. The French army suppressed it brutally, killing thousands. In the aftermath, Napoleon suggests his identification not only with the prophet, but also with the Mahdi, as he proclaims uh, the formation of a new diwan, and I won't read you the, his proclamation, uh, but he says that, again, he affirms that his coming was predicted in the Quran, and that anyone who opposes his rule is opposing God's will. It's hard to know if Napoleon believed that such proclamations would have any effect on the Egyptian people. Yet if we believe his memoirs, after the, this temporary setback, he went from success to success. His ally, the Sheriff of Mecca, calls down the benediction of the prophet on him. When, on 14 June 1799, he returned to Cairo from an expedition in Syria, he is hailed as returning triumphant sultan, showered with gifts, including fine cloth, coffee, spices, elaborately equipped camels, and slaves, male and female, African and Georgian. Napoleon cites at length the proclamation of the sheikhs of Al-Azhar made on this occasion. They affirmed that the general was protected by God, that he loved the prophet, and that he carefully read the Quran every day. It was his intention, they said, to build the most splendid mosque in the world and to embrace the religion of Muhammad. Now, whether or not he ever intended to do so, he obviously didn't. He soon found out that conditions were favorable to him uh, for him to return to France. He returned, he left Alexandria on 23 August, uh, arrived in Paris on 16 October, and by 10 November had seized power. Before leaving Egypt, he issued a series of memos for the French administration in Egypt. He justified his choice of the ulama, the natural leaders of the Arab nation who loved justice, uh, to be the, to rule uh, for the French. In particular, they are the interpreters of the Quran. Since religious opposition is the main source of resistance to French rule, their willingness to read the Quran in ways favorable to French domination is crucial. He insisted that one must take great care to persuade the Muslims that we love the Quran and that we venerate the Prophet. One thoughtless word uh, or action can destroy the work of many years. Now, Napoleon's proclamation to Egypt, identifying himself with the prophet and the Mahdi, and affirming that his coming to Egypt was pred predicted by the Quran, appear two centuries later to be self-serving, cynical, and downright silly. To us, the contradictions are manifest in a French army that claims to be importing Republican values, affirms its compatibility with the Quran, and brutally massacres thousands in an attempt to quell opposition. Yet nothing indicates Napoleon himself recognized this, either during his time in Egypt or years later on St. Helena. He defends his strategy as appropriate, indeed brilliant, the best manner to spread, fr spread French power and values and to undermine the English. But to focus on conclusion on the subject that interests us here today, reading the Quran in the context of empire, Napoleon's reading the Quran was a key element in his imperial strategy. His Quran was, of course, Savary's, an Enlightenment translation that presented Islam as pure rational theism. He read it through the intermediary of uh, Savary's presentation and introduction. It was a brilliant legislative creation of an inspired author, Muhammad. 
Napoleon hoped to impose his reading of the Quran on the Cairo ulama with only a vague sense of the very different intellectual baggage they brought with them. Century of, uh, centuries of tafsir and fiqh learned, among others, at al-Azhar, which Napoleon describes the Sorbonne of Egypt, whose founder he erroneously identifies as Saladin. What made Napoleon fail in Egypt was not hostility or disdain towards Islam. On the contrary, it was a naive enthusiasm for it. Thank you. Thank you. So I come to the Quran as a philologist, which is a historian in a sense, but a historian of language. Instead of looking at events, uh, the thing that interests me is linguistic transformation. And an element of that understanding linguistic transformation, of course, is understanding literary structure and the transformation of literary structure. The presentation I have for you today are a series of notes uh, that kind of emerged out of a reading that I did of Al-Farabi, who talks a lot about the context, the idea of the ummah within his explanation of Greek philosophy. He kind of inserts the idea of ummah into Greek philosophy. It doesn't exist. There's Medina, there's a city. And um, part of his discussion is, uh, kind of, he's kind of preoccupied with explaining difference among ummahs. Why is it that if God created the ummahs, if God created the ummah, why is there a difference among them if there's a singular origin? And there was a book I was reading by Robert Orwin, just came out recently on Al-Farabi. And he comes up with various theories as to why Al-Farabi thinks this. Uh, in my presentation today, I want to suggest that perhaps there are pieces of this that we can find, uh, of Farabi's thought, that we can find in the Quran itself, in the Quran's vision of the Ummah. Specifically, that we can find an, an explanation of multiplicity, of difference among people, among the Ummah, uh, within the Quran. And today I'm going to focus specifically on the rainwater, what I'm calling the rainwater metaphor. I'm going to lead you through a series of Quranic texts. I've given you the Quranic texts in Arabic. It's just a selection to kind of give you the overall idea of the argument that I'm trying to create. I want to start with Surah Al-Baqarah, which is a surah which is very strongly associated with the um, program of community formation that occurs, as we understand it, in Medina, which is where uh, there's various strategies of pulling together a, a community that is in formation, that is eclectic and, and, and uh, has lots of difference uh, within it. Within Surah Al-Baqarah, towards the beginning, it introduces the communal insider, people that are the mu'minun, and then the communal outsiders. And in the explanation of the communal outsider, it has this um, allegory that the communal outsider responds to the coming of rain clouds in this particular way. I'm going to read this to you. This is A on your handout. Oh, oh, so it says, Mathalahum. Mathalahum, yani the mathal of the outsiders, of the people that are the kafirun. Kasaybin min as-sama'i fihi dhulumatun wa ra'adun wa barqun yaj'aluna asabi'ahim fi adhanihim min as-sawa'iqi. Hadar al-maut. Wallahu muhitu bil kafirin. Yukad al barqu يَخْطَفُوا أَبْصَارَهُمْ كُلَّمَا أَضَاءَ لَهُمْ مَشُوا فِيهِ وَإِذَا أَظْلَمَ عَلَيْهِمْ قَامُوا So it describes this communal outsider being in, in a state of confusion. And in my reading, this is a prophetological image. It's the coming of prophecy, and the communal outsider's response to prophecy is kind of like the response of someone to thunderclaps, fear. Um, further down in this handout, in the, in, the, in the same passage, it again revisits this rainwater metaphor. It says in verse 22, this is describing God, this is Abdu Rabbukum, This is where I began, which is why is there this rainwater metaphor in this intensely communitarian context within the Quran? I'm going to try to convince you of two things today in these 25 minutes. First is that the rainwater metaphor is a prophetological image. It encodes a complex semiotics of prophecy that is the axes of Quranic communitarianism, that is the formation of a community, of an ummah. As a prophetological image, hence, the rainwater, for, uh, rainwater metaphor could be read for its communitarian valences. I just mean communitarian, meaning uh, the program of community formation, the strategies of community formation, of kinship formation. Secondly, I'm going to try to convince you that the rainwater metaphor is the rhetorical artifact of a strategy of community formation that can be characterized in part as ecumenical. Uh, in that it explains through allegory why prophecy, huda, guidance from God, has a singular origin, yet has, produces multiplicity in the world. 
both multiplicity in the umam, in the different types of umam that emerge, also multiplicity or difference in the way people respond to prophecy. We see here already people responding to prophecy with fear or with jubilation, that kind of multiplicity. Now, the rainwater metaphor appears twice in Surah Al-Baqarah. Farther down, B on your handout, I just want to point this out again. It appears again, وَمَا أَنزَلَ اللَّهُ مِنَ السَّمَاءِ مِنْ مَاءٍ فَأَحْيَا بِهِ الْأَرْضِ بَعْدَ مَوْتِهَا وَبَثَّ فِيهَا مِنْ كُلِّ دَابَةٍ وَتَصْرِيفَ الرِّيَاحِ وَالصَّحَابِ الْمُسَخَّرْ بَيْنَ السَّمَاءِ وَالْأَرْضِ لِآيَاتٍ لِقَوْمٍ يَعْقِلُونَ Again, it's talking about the uh, series of ayahs, a series of signs from God, uh, the very typical signs, the changing of the day to the night, the movement of ships on water, and then this image, ma'an min as that one water comes from the sky and produces, you know, but that it produces all this multiplicity on the earth. Now, this image is a very old one. Before I delve into it more, I just want to explain one more time what I mean by ecumenicism and ecumenical. How does the rainwater metaphor perhaps capture as an artifact this ecumenical impulse that the proto-Muslims, that the earliest Muslims had? Now, Fred Donner, of course, talks a lot about the ecumenicism of the, of the believers movement. And so my comments are building on that observation. Imran al-Badawi talks about it also. In the sense that at some point within the formation of the proto-Muslim community, there was a spirit of ecumenicism, which is that there was a strategy of community formation that gave primacy to common denominators as a means of, of boundary formation rather than difference. Um, we see it reflected in Surah Al-Baqarah in a host of different ways. Sometimes it's very clearly comes out in, in the form of anti-Jewish or anti-Christian polemic in the sense that the Jews and Christians are not ecumenical. For instance, in the context of this ayah that I just read to you, there are other verses that say, for instance, the Christians are baseless, the Jews say the Christians are baseless, the Christians say the Jews are baseless. This kind of language, one way of understanding it is that it's implying an ecumenical approach to community formation. It's critiquing these other communities. Now, the rainwater metaphor appears in the Quran um, as a prophetological image and typically appears in context of transformation, which is that when rain comes down from the sky, it causes a sudden transformation in the earth, sometimes inexplicable transformation, um, particularly ihya, the coming of death back to life, and multiplicity, ikhtilaf in Arabic. Typically the word ikhtilaf appears in the context of the rainwater metaphor. Um, it's not hard to understand why it's a prophetological image because frequently, of course, it appears with terms that we typically associate with prophetology, anzala, arsala, bash, um, you know, bushra, um, nudr. These type, this type of vocabulary appears frequently expla uh, when it's explaining rain clouds or the coming of rain or the coming down of rainwater. Now, the image is very old. If you go all the way back to an early Quranic surah, Surah 77, Al-Mursalat, you see the image of the rain clouds coming in. I just want you to pay attention to the language, which is that it's, uh, and to try to convince you that it's a prophetological image. وَالْمُرْسَلَاتِ عُرْفَ وَالْعَاسِفَاتِ عَصْفَ وَالنَّاشِرَاتِ نَشْرَ فَالْفَارِقَاتِ فَرْقَ وَالْمُلْقِيَاتِ ذِكْرَ أُذْرًا أَوْ نُذْرًا it's explaining, Bell's translation, to be clear, is by those that are set, sent gently, then come with hurricane, blast hurricane, at times scatter around, at times divide asunder, and finally drop reminders, excuse or warning. Angelica Neuwirth has looked at this passage, and she says in her, uh, and she looks at oath clusters, this is one of those oath clusters, she says that, uh, this is enigmatic, this image is enigmatic because, quote, it's uh, pro pronouncedly profane imagery, which may be found little consistent with the general purpose of the surahs as documents of a, quote, religious discourse. But Neuwirth later on points out in the same um, article that perhaps the image here of rainfall, quote, she says, what actually comes down are acoustical drops of rain sui generis, which are verses of dhikr. So she says that perhaps this is an image about dhikr coming down from the, from the sky and the rain clouds being a metaphor for prophecy. Moving ahead, I want to skip to a much later surah, which is Al-Araf, Q7, which is close to now the Surah Al-Baqarah's context. And here we see that this image of rain clouds has developed quite a bit. In fact, in Al-Araf, this image appears right before there's a series of Prof prophetic narratives, we're going to hear a lot about them, the punishment stories, the skhafil again, and this is one of those 
uh, passages. This is, the pre this is right before that long list of stories. It starts with Noah, then goes on uh, through various prophets. Um, again, the multiplicity of prophecy is prefaced by this rainwater metaphor. هو الذي يرسل الرياح بشرا بين يدا رحمته حتى إذا أقلت سحابا ثقالا سقناه لبلد ميت فأنزلنا به الماء فأخرجنا به من كل الثمرات كذلك نخرج الموت لعلكم تذكرون والبلد البلد الطيب يخرج نباته بإذن ربه والذي خبث لا يخرج إلا نكدا كذلك نصرف الآيات لقوم من يشكرون Here, there's clearly a value judgment, which is that one rain falls from the sky, but based on the quality of the earth, it's going to produce different kinds of results. If you think about this in the context of the larger surah, it then goes on and talks about all these different umam that have different reactions to uh, prophecy coming down, down to them. Now, just to give you guys a little bit more of a sense of the metaphor as it appears in the Quran, I've also included a middle Quranic surah. I've given you an early Quranic surah, a late Quranic surah. Al-Furqan is typically understood in the Nold al kashwali um, chronology as a middle Quranic surah. Uh, and again, you see here the image, this is D on your handout, Al-Furqan. وَهُوَ الَّذِي أَرْسَلَ الرِّيَاحَ بُشْرًا بَيْنَ يَدَ رَحْمَتِهِ وَأَنزَلْنَا مِنَ السَّمَاءِ مَاءً طَهُورًا بِهِ بَلْدَةً مَيْ and then it goes on. I just want to point out at the end, it says the last verse, This is universalistic, inclusivistic, ecumenical language. This idea that prophecy appears in all nations in all times. In every ummah, ma kan ummah illa khala fiha. No, I'm mixing it up. I'm mixing it up. <laughs> It'll come back. There's another one coming down. Now, for the remainder of the uh, presentation, actually, let me let me let me show you. Let me talk about Surah An Nahl, which is Q16. It's also a later Quranic surah. Um, here again, you see that the idea of rainwater is associated with multiplicity and transformation in the earth. This idea that ma'un, one water comes from the sky, but produces different things out of the earth. Now I'm going to skip down and it says وَمَا ذَرَعَ لَكُمْ فِي الْأَرْضِ مُخْتَلِفًا أَلْوَانُهُ إِنَّ فِي ذَلِكَ لَآيَاتٍ لِقَوْمٍ يَذَكَّرُونَ Oftentimes you see the rainwater metaphor in conjunction with the multiplicity of color in the natural world. One water from the sky, multiple colors on the earth. Now this of course has no value judgment in it. In Surah Al-Araf there's a clear value judgment which is that it's not just any color. Some colors are good, some things that grow out are good and some things that grow out are bad. Here you don't see that. This is an earlier, an earlier example. Now as I said for the remainder of my time I'm going to focus specifically on what are typically understood to be Meccan three surahs, the latest surahs. This is kind of going in, in line with the sort of investigation that Angelica Neuwirth or Nikolai Sinai um, pursue, which is to understand how are the literary structures of the Quran tied to the formation of the proto-Muslim community, of the believers movement. Can we periodize along the development of the Quran, the development of the communal ethos of this particular community that these texts are addressing? So in the Meccan surahs, in the late Meccan surahs, in the Meccan three surahs, you see a fair amount of consistency, which is again and again you see the image of rainwater tied to transformation the ahya, the coming, the coming to life of the dead earth, but also multiplicity, ikhtilaf, the fact that one rainwater causes multiplicity in the earth. I want to start with Surah Ar-Rum, which has this really interesting structure, uh, a series of ayahs which all start min ayatihi, min ayatihi, min ayatihi, and it lists all the typical naturalistic imagery we see in the Quran, the night and day, the, 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 the ships, uh, all the typical naturalistic imagery, and included in these ayat is the ayah, is the sign of rainwater. So I'm going to read um, Surah so Al-Rum. I'm just going to read little pieces of it. Uh, 19. This is we should already thinking. Okay, the rainwater metaphor is coming, and it comes very soon after. Um, 
in verse, uh, actually, let me also point out in multiplicity, verse 22, min ayatihi ikhtilaf al-sinatukum wa al-wanikum, inna fi thalika li ayatin lil alameen. And then continuing on to verse uh, 23, wa min ayatihi yurikum al-barqa khawfan wa tam'an. This should remind us of the Surah Al-Baqarah, the ayah in Surah Al-Baqarah. وَيُنَزِّلُوا مِنَ السَّمَاءِ مَاءً فَيُحْيِي بِهِ الْأَرْضِ بَعْدَ مَوْتِهَا إِنَّ فِي ذَلِكَ لَآيَاتٍ لِقَوْمٍ يَعْقِلُونَ I'm not going to go much more into this, but what's interesting about Surah Al-Rum, again, is um, how does the Qur'an use naturalistic imagery as ayahs? Of course, the Qur'an talks about the ayah as the sign that messages from God are composed of ayahs, of signs. And some of these ayahs are in the ufaq, in the farthest horizons of perception, and others are in the anfus, are inside yourselves. Rainwater appears repeatedly as an ayah, and here there's an ambiguity because it's both an ayah in the sense that it's a sign of God's revelation, but also we should understand that it's an ayah because it's a prophetological image. It's a prophetological image. Um, <clears throat> okay, I'm going to turn now to Surah uh, Az-Zumar which is a late Meccan surah. And here, this example I just wanted to give you because you see again the rainwater metaphor tied in with multiplicity in a prophetological context. All of the passages I've given you in my readings are, with the exception of uh, Mursalat, the first one, are in explicitly community-forming contexts. So there's a community that's being addressed and that is being, tried, that is being convinced of being part of the community. There's a boundary that's being formed. I want you to keep that in mind as you hear this, uh, this next verse. Surah uh, Az-Zumar, which is 39. أَلَمْ تَرَى أَنَ اللَّهَ أَنزَلَ مِنَ السَّمَاءِ مَاءً فَسَلَكَهُ يَنَابِعَ فِي الْأَرْضِ ثُمَّ يُخْرِجُ بِهِ زَرْعًا مُخْتَلِفًا أَلْوَانُهُ ثُمَّ يُهِيجُ فَتَرَاهُ مُصْفَرًا ثُمَّ يَجْعَلُهُ خُطَامًا إِنَّ فِي ذَلِكَ لِذِكْرَ لِأُولِ الْأَلْبَابِ And then if you look farther down, you see the same language repeated again, but this time talking very specifically about prophecy. اللَّهُ نَزَّلَ أَحْسَنَ الْحَدِيثِ كِتَابًا مُتَشَابِهًا It continues on. Okay. So now I'm moving swiftly on to the last passage that I'd like to discuss with you. This is again a late Meccan surah, right before the Medinan period, uh, Fatir. Um, and here you see all the different elements that I've been building up, transformation and multiplicity specifically in the context of prophetological language. In, it starts out, in anta illa nadirun inna arsalnaka bil haqqi bashiran wa nadiran wa, min, wa in min ummatin illa khala fiha nadirun. That's the verse I was trying to remember earlier. In min ummatin illa khala fiha nadirun. This type of language appears often in conjunction with the rainwater metaphor. Moving farther down, it says, Alam tara an Allah anzala min as samai ma'an فَخْرَجْنَا بِهِ ثَمَرَاتٍ مُخْتَلِفًا أَلْوَانُهَا وَمِنَ الْجَبَالِ جُدَدٌ بَيْدٌ وَحُمْرٌ مُخْتَلِفٌ أَلْوَانُهَا وَغَرَابِيبُ السُّودٌ وَمِنَ النَّاسِ وَالدَّوَابِ وَالْعَنْعَامِ مُخْتَلِفٌ أَلْوَانُهُ كذلك. And it continues on in that way. Again, it's tying the idea of one water coming from the sky, one huda coming from the sky, one Risala coming from the sky, but producing mukhtalif alwan, different colors, different iterations on the earth. In Fatir, again, you don't necessarily see a value judgment. You see an explanation, because of course the Quran is concerned with explaining if prophecy has a singular origin, why then is there so much differentiation among the various communities? It critiques and polemicizes the sectarianism of the Jews and Christians, particularly in the late Meccan, early Medinan surahs. And so I believe the rainwater metaphor gives us a little bit of an insight of how, of how that ethos, that communal ethos, is reflected in the literary structures and literary forms of, uh, of the Qur'an. Now, in my reading, the rainwater metaphor engenders a kind of ambiguation between natural transformation and multiplicity and cultural or social transformation and multiplicity in relationship to prophecy. 
as rainwater produces diverse fruit, thamarat, entirely different types of vegetation, diverse reactions from people, like people who are hadar al mouth scared for their death because of the thunderclaps, and diverse colors in nature, so too does prophecy produce diverse fruit, entirely different responses among human communities, entirely different uh, transformations in the temporal realm. The ambiguation between the natural and the social in the Quran is already, of course, well established. I would remind you, uh, for instance, of the verse in the Quran which talks that all the creatures in the earth and the birds that fly on their wing in the sky, they're all uh, ummas, communities like you are. Ummuman amthalukum. No one is overlooked in scripture. Um, and also I would remind you of the image of the bee in Q16 where God inspires the bees. Awha, I believe, is the verse. And... Um, it says that God inspires the bees, awha, the bees, and then from their butuniha, from their uh, bellies, emerge uh, drinks, sharab, mukhtalif alwanuhu, a drink that is of different colors. So this image of unity and multiplicity appears in natural imagery throughout the Quran. The rainwater metaphor is just one of those examples. So what I'm trying to suggest here is that it's A, a prophetological image, and B, that this prophetological image is embedded within a larger program of community formation, which at some point in its development, perhaps in the Meccan three Medina in one period, as we understand it, um, could be described, as Fred Don or others have described, as ecumenical, in the sense that the strategy of community formation was to find common ground among difference, rather than to assert doctrinal or ritual differences. Thank you.